Before the concluding panel, we have a session where we will turn our atten attention to the importance of leadership and building preparedness in the event of crisis. In these times, preparedness is, in organizations is of utmost importance. But how can we be prepared for the unforeseen? Our next speaker underlines that it's all about leadership and planning. Please give a warm welcome to Professor of Leadership, Innovation and Anticipation at the University of Stavanger. And he's also a chairholder of the UNESCO Chair on Leadership, Rune Todnem B. Thank you, thank you. I always feel, feel like a member of a boy band from the 80s or something, wearing one of these. But I promise you, no dance moves. Uh, I need something to have dance moves. I need something that you get in the bar here. So if you're here this evening, you need to go for the, I think, the top choice gin and tonic with cucumber in. And then you take all the stairs up to the pool room. It's really cool. You, you can go all the way up without a gin and tonic. It's, it's, not, it's not a connection there. Um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I am so fortunate that I work in academia. Uh, I have the fortune to have a stage where I talk to others, but more importantly, I, I listen to others, I learn from others. Um, my two areas of my portfolio is kind of leadership and organizational change. And at the moment, I'm also so lucky to look after the, the UNESCO chair in leadership, innovation, and anticipation. And anticipation is really about looking at different kinds of futures because the future is not set. Um, so when I was invited to make the application, they said, Rune, this is about the future. And I said, okay. And I hadn't really thought much about the future. And I hadn't really thought much about futures with an S, with the plural. There isn't one future, there could be different futures. So that will, that will inform a little bit of what I'm going to talk um, about today. But as you see there, I start the heading with always prepared. I don't know how many of you grew up and you answered the question, or the command rather, be prepared, always prepared. Yeah, I see some fellow scouts here, very, very good. Um, so perhaps in the scouts, I was there from I was seven till 18. Um, then I was in the armed forces. Um, then I was a NATO paramedic in Bosnia uh, for a couple of contracts. And during all these tasks, we kind of knew what we had to be prepared for. I still remember when I was standing in this big six-wheeler Sisu, vehicle produced in, in Finland, and we were driving out to uh, an area where someone had perhaps walked on a landmine or there'd been some other kind of accident, and we were on the, wearing the helmets with the communication, we received information all the time. Receiving information so that we could be as prepared as possible when we arrived at the scene. And this is the kind of situation that we have been used to. This is just an you know, old-fashioned gap analysis. And I picked this because I like smiley faces. But of course, the smiley face could be in the opposite direction. You know, very often, we are leaving something behind when you talk about organizational change. Because what I want to take my 19 minutes left now to talk about is our role when it comes to preparedness, our role as individuals, our role in teams, our role as organizational members. Because it's so easy, or at least it's easier, to have an opinion about others. It's very easy to have an opinion about Trump. Do we have opinions about ourselves and our roles and how we perform our roles? Um, so this is kind of an easy gap analysis. When things were easy, we know where we are and we know where we're going. But it ain't that easy. Because if you really use this and ask people where they are, if you ask organizations where they are, we don't necessarily know where we are. And for sure, we don't know where we're going. We like to pretend we know where we're going. So again, in my field, or one of my fields, organizational change, we say 70% of all fail, of all change fail. Well, I have a colleague that kind of investigated that statement or that percentage, and it's false. There is no evidence to suggest that 70% of all change fail. But anyway, we agree a lot of organizational change fail. And that's because we spend a lot of time in the middle. We spend a lot of time implementing something new. And sometimes that new is some, 
think we left behind five or 10 or 15 years ago, okay? But these are, these are kind of hamster in the wheel kind of spending the time because we haven't spent enough time defining where we are and defining where we need to be. So again, going back to the, the always prepared. So say one or two weekends every month, it was the favorite time of our parents because we were going out scouting. What happens? We all go into the cars, not one in each car. We gathered and filled up the car. A father or mother drove up, up to, a, to a wood. Sounds like they're going to do something horrendous to us. They barely slowed down before they opened the door and kicked us out and said, see you Sunday, Vroom. going home, doing whatever they wanted to do when the kids are not there. Okay. Hopefully we had a compass with us. Hopefully we had a map, hopefully the right map. There's a code on it. What do we do when we're lost, when we're out walking or out sailing? What do we do when we're lost? We stop. We don't just continue hoping, oh yeah, we'll, we'll find our way somehow. You know, we might be lucky. We stop and we triangulate. We gather information so we find out, well, there's a farm down there. There's a mountain over there. And there seems to be some some electricity going over us here. Based on this information, we found out where we are and then we continue on our journey. That's the simple picture, but we're not necessarily good enough doing it as individuals or in our teams or in our organizations. But really, today doesn't look simple. Today is full of questions. What? What did you say? Where are we going? How do we get there? Or really, we should go somewhere else now? How good, are we are, how good are we at asking questions? How good are we at seeking out different people to ask the questions to? How good are we at receiving answers? How good are we at being challenged? So I don't know if anyone of you like uh, TEDx on YouTube. Do you like TEDx, like short? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite TEDx is by a lady called Margaret Heffernan. And uh, the title is, if I remember correctly, is Dare to Disagree. Dare to Disagree. And it's really about, she says, why, why, why are we so f scared of conflict? She refers to this research that shows that big numbers of European CEOs does almost everything to avoid conflict. You know, you'd rather die than have a conflict. In Norway, for sure, we don't like conflicts. That's one of the biggest changes I experienced because I got most of my academic background, education and, and experience from, uh, as a professor from the UK. I came back to Norway and I found out in Norway, my experience, it was very difficult to ask a question or to make an observation without that being taken almost in instantly personal. In the UK, you could have the biggest fight and then you go to the pub for a pint. You completely disagree on something. You don't hate each other, and you don't think someone attacked you for asking it the question. So in this TED talk, Margaret Heffernan says, we are doing so much to avoid conflict, but what is really conflict? Conflict is disagreement. So we disagree, we ask questions. Have you thought about this when you made that decision? Well, we tried that once, and this is what happened. Not to suggest it couldn't work better this time around, but just so you know, this is what happened when we tried that in that context. We're not very good, and it starts with us. How good are we at asking questions? How good are we at receiving answers? How good are we at talking to the people we never really talk to? So I'm gonna give you some tools, not because I believe you need tools. You all have plenty of tools and plenty of experience, but I just want to, rather than sharing information, I want to share some tools that you might be able to take away with you, use or throw away, forget about them right away if you want to, but I want to challenge some of our assumptions. And my starting point is an academic, so I'm not, I'm not pointing at anyone. As academics, most of us have a PhD. Every single PhD is the most important PhD in the world. I hope you know that. My PhD is the most important PhD in the world. Why should I bother talking to someone who is not me? Yeah, I'm exaggerating. But we're highly specialized. I got a PhD in leadership. 
There are, P there are people with PhDs in leadership that don't even talk together. They know about each other, if you're lucky. They don't talk together because they disagree about something. The method, for example. The data set. Or how dare you suggest something new. Okay? The point is, we are not very good at working with people that are not necessarily like us, or people that we feel conflict from. I'm not going to invite him to that meeting. I'm not going to invite her to that meeting. Always oh, ask so difficult questions. Make me look stupid. No, no, I make myself look stupid if that's how I think. But this is one kind of, let's call it theory. So rather than pointing at others and worrying about others, we should start with ourselves. And this depends if you look at the glass as half full or half empty. You can call it control, uh, circles of control or circles of concern. I like half full. Uh, so let's start with control. There's a lot of things that we can control. There's even more that we can influence, and then there's a lot that we might be concerned about. For example, Trump. Okay? But we can't do anything about it unless we have the right to vote in, in the US, in that case. Okay? But we spend a lot of time worrying. Worrying about things we can't do much about, even if we spend all our time worrying. So rather we should spend more time focused on what can we control, what can we influence, and then hopefully we can grow these circles, perhaps we can control more. And I'm not talking about control as a power thing, I'm talking about what we can do something about. So in some other talks I have, and I will refer to it later on, I talk a lot about being mad, making a difference. We're, we're all mad. We're mad, good and bad, in different ways. But then people say to me, yeah, but there, there's not much I can control. Life is tough. Okay, but then let me just let me just start. So, how many here dressed themselves this morning and decided what to put on? Yeah, even the men. Have you heard this story? Someone else put their clothing out there. This is what you should wear. How many decided to have breakfast or not to have breakfast today? What to have or not to have? What to drink? Coffee or tea? Yeah, there is so much that we decide. How many say good morning to your colleagues in the morning? or not? How many say good, e good evening before we go home, or not? There's a heck of a lot of things that we control. Okay? Even if I have a bad day, I will say good morning most likely. Yeah? Even if I don't like someone because we just disagreed about something, I will say good evening. And I won't think, hope you're burning. No, no, I will mean it. Okay? So this is just another example. There is so much that we can control. Some of the examples I mentioned mood, so a lot of behavior. We can control our behavior. And then I believe this, this was inside one of my shirts, it was, it was just there. You make a difference. We need to start with ourselves, we can make a difference. So, two tools. One I call uh, PAC, is something I, I looked at in leadership, but I don't look at leadership as something leaders do. I look at leadership as a collective uh, um, pursuit of delivering on purpose. A collective pursuit of delivering on purpose. So we can all, no matter who we are, where we are in an organization, can contribute to leadership. That's my starting point. Um, but it's all about, do we uh, as an individual, as a team, as an organization, do we have a purpose? Purpose. It could be a higher purpose. And a purpose is not something vague. We just you know, talk about over a glass of wine. Purpose is really, really important. A purpose should inform core values. Basically, what do we do and what don't we do? And these core values should inform what we do. Actions. A lot of us don't have purpose statements in organizations. Yeah, we have a strategy. Well, who knows the strategy? Who read the strategy? Who knows the vision statement? Uh, most likely we don't. And then is alignment. So we have purpose, and once we have a purpose, purpose we need to align. And what I like to think about then is basically, uh, when I was younger, I really wanted a pair of Levi's 501. Anyone here lucky enough had a pair? Brilliant. You should hold on to them. They're getting they're increasing in value. I understand. Yeah. And what's do you remember what's back on this uh, leather patch? What's the symbol in the leather patch? Anyone? Is this? This is a marketing picture from 1873, and it's a pair of Levi's, not necessarily 501, hanging there in the middle, 
to show how strong it is, how durable it is. And each horse with a handler pulling in each direction. Imagine if this pair of jeans is your team or your department or your organization. And each horse is individual interests pulling in different directions. It's not two horses, the many horses. We cannot be very prepared as an organization if we have all these internal battles, if we are not pulling in the same direction. But we can pull in the same direction and still ask difficult questions to each other. But we really need to get accustomed to asking difficult questions, challenge each other, and so on. And then is the commitment. Uh, I'm not married, I've never been married, I don't think I ever will be married, but I think there's something about you commit yourself to good and bad days, not just the good days, right? So if you have a purpose that you, that you are aligned to, you should be committed to that purpose. And the purpose should really be something that is kind of set in stone for at least 50 years for an organization. And then I'm not a designer or a design thinker or an expert, but a couple of years ago we got the opportunity, we got some external funding, create a new master's program. So we now have the, what we proudly say is the, it's Norway's only design-informed master's program in, in leadership. Uh, so we have some uh, principles of design thinking. I'm just going to show you two examples. And if you remember only one thing from my little uh, input here today, uh, check out the Design Council, the British Design Council online. They're the one that came up with this. And uh, this is really about how we, not how we design a car or a pair of shoes or anything like this. This is about how we think. And there's a, there's a huge toolbox on design thinking. But I'm just going to show you this, which is called the double diamond. And what it suggests is this problem space and solution space. It basically suggests that what we need to do before we even think about jumping into solution space is to spend much more time on defining what is the problem. Spend more time on defining what's the problem. The first time I used this tool was in the delivery of an executive MBA class that I had delivered for eight years. And we had to walk around policing the participants not to jump into solution space. And the feedback on that one day was, Runa, this is a room of 30 successful, experienced people from different uh, companies saying, Runa, we have never been given this much time to define the problem. We've never been given this much time. This much time was half past eight to half past 11. This much time. And if you're really gonna define the problem in the best possible way, you need to embrace diversity and inclusion. And that's not as, as a political thing, and it's not necessarily about gender, sexuality, abilities. It's diversity of what's in this box. That we're from different backgrounds, we have different opinions, we will challenge each other. Together we will come up with different definitions what, what, than what either of us could have done on our own in our small clubs of like-minded thinkers. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the model there because I'm aware of the time, but that's the first thing. Spend more time defining the problem with people that don't normally work with. People that think differently to you. People with different opinions than you. This is just a, a different uh, presentation of it. All the sentences under are examples of tools that can be used. This toolbox for design thinking is huge. And I don't suggest this for you that want to become design thinkers. I suggest you have a look at this, no matter what role you're playing within your organization. And if you want to do better, you want your team to do better, so that you can be much more prepared for whatever is around the corner. And whatever is around the corner, we don't know what it is. So to be as prepared as possible, we need to embrace uncertainty, we need to embrace working with people that we feel challenge us. And we need to step up and challenge them. The core principles here, the three of them, mention that, focus on defining problem before you go into defining solutions. And of course, to any one problem, there's not one solution, there's a whole heap of solutions. I'm not saying break down silos, but at least work between silos, build bridges between silos, have coffee chats with people that, that belongs in different silos. Silos could be the neighbor office, 
could be another organization that actually, at least they think they work with the same as you, and perhaps, hopefully, you know about them. And then embrace the iterative process. So I'm getting to the closing of this input now. The iterative process is about test as soon as you have something to test. Many of us are so scared of testing because once we, once we test, it's visible. Oh my God, I put my idea out there. What if I look stupid? What if I fail? What if I fall flat on my face? Well, hopefully you'll be able to pick yourself up or you have a good team that will help you with that picking up. Yeah? So this is what uh, some of the design thinkers uh, kind of suggest. Fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. I'm not a big fan of the word fail because of the way it's being perceived. But think about the word fail as learn. Learn fast, learn cheap, and learn often. So you don't wait until the end of the timeline and you go this way or that way. Oh, that was the right way. Yoo-hoo! Oh, that was the wrong way. Okay, let's pretend that didn't happen. Yeah? Or test, test, test. Learn, learn, learn. Fail, fail, fail. Leading to success. And this is about how we think. How we feel about ourselves. Are we willing to show our vulnerabilities? Or are we saying, well, I'm a professor of leadership and I'm being a professor for donkeys of years and I feel very good about my knowledge. And my job for the rest of my life, and I have at least, I don't know, 30 years left before I can retire, am I going to just repeat the same knowledge because that's where I'm the expert? Or am I going to seek others and learn from others and develop with others? Second to last slide. So this is kind of my uh, challenge, both to myself and to everyone here. We have the potential to become silo busters. Yeah? To bust down some of these silos, work with people from other silos. It's like Nikolai Tangen, head of the oil fund or uh, pension fund uh, abroad. He was invited to the annual talk at NHH, the leading uh, Norwegian business school, uh, in, in commemoration of the person who started the school. And basically he said, in Norway we have a problem in senior management and leadership. It's, it's too much the same. Too many people, now. I'm sure you have a Swedish business school that is kind of similar, that is the best business school. Too many people have read the same books, have had the same professors, and then he kind of pauses. Too many of them come from this place, and then they zoomed in on the rector on the business school. He wasn't too happy about that necessarily. But his, his message was, you don't need 10 of the people with the same background around the decision-making table. You need one or two from that background, one or two with that background, one or two with that background. And of course, arts and creativity will become more and more important. So I think we're looking out, it's a very uncertain world. If we want to be as prepared as is possible for really things that we can't plan for, how can we be prepared for the unknown? I think we need to challenge our way of thinking, our way of working, and think that I am already making a difference, but if I can work with people I don't normally work with, I can make even more of a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Rune. Uh, may I ask you, in a crisis, we might not have the time to define problems, not even two hours, mm. and we don't want to fail. Can you tell us more about what can happen to leadership in a specific crisis? Should the leadership be uh, focusing on being creative and respond to the specific situation in the moment of crisis? Or is leadership in these situations more about hold, holding on to rules and decided plans? And what I'm trying to ask is if we should all be prepared to step up as leaders in a crisis or should we hold on to old structures and decisions? What is the best in a crisis? Yes, yeah, so of course, if you're, if you're on Titanic, you can't uh, talk to everyone, <laughs> which way should we go? Uh, but also perhaps we should avoid making decisions based on the traditional um, hierarchy. You know, it's I should make the decision because, well, I can be brutally traditional, it's because I'm the man. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. or I should make the decision because I have the three stars, or I should make the decision because I have the title. If we know each other because we have a culture of talking together, defining problems and solutions together, we might know instantly and trust instantly the person that is best placed to make the best possible uh, decision at, in that moment of time. But my point is that is not necessarily always the one that is most senior in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So what I often say when I go into have executive delivery and in board meetings and so on, when I want to, 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 to create some discussion, I say, you know, not all leaders uh, provide leadership. And of course, a lot of former leaders almost feel offended by me just suggesting that. Mm -hmm. So I think when you need quick decisions, you need to know you have a team and it could be different individuals who are best placed to make that quick decision depending on the context. Okay. Thank you, Rune. Give Thank a warm you. applause to Rune. Thank you. <clears throat>